2nd of this month, an exciting new artificial satellite was launched. It was originally known as UK-6, and now that it is safely in orbit, it's been renamed Aerial-6. And this is all British. It was built jointly by Marconi and British Aerospace, and at the moment it's going around the world once every 97 minutes at the height of something like 360 miles. Now, it's been designed to do two specific tasks, to study cosmic rays from space and also X-rays. And you can't do that from the Earth's surface because they're blocked out by layers in the Earth's upper air. So for this particular kind of research, rockets and above all, Earth satellites are absolutely essential. Well, as I've said, this is an all-British project, and the satellite was actually built at Portsmouth, where, before launch, it was described for us by project scientist Dr. Leonard Culhane of University College London. I'm standing next to the UK-6 satellite. Uh, you'll see that it's, at the moment, in a clean room, which is why I'm wearing these clean overalls necessary to do assembly work on the satellite under quite clean conditions. Coming to the satellite itself, you'll see here one of the four solar panels. These panels have uh, silicon solar cells mounted along here. When the satellite is in orbit, the base of the spacecraft points in the general direction of the sun, so that solar radiation falling on these panels can provide electric power for the experiments and the satellite systems. In fact, the satellite is standing on a fixture when in space the effective base of the satellite will be here. This fixture, fixture is shortly to be used for the spin and balance testing. The satellite has four transmitting antennae, like this one, located around its base. These are used to transmit the data collected by the experiments to a ground station which is located at Winkfield near Slough. Because only one ground station is used in the UK-6 program, the satellite spends periods of up to 15 hours each day out of contact with the ground station. It therefore carries on board within the structure two tape recorders on which data are recorded during the 15 hours in which it is out of contact with the ground station. At the end of this interval, when the satellite returns to contact, tape recorders are played back and all of the data acquired during this period is received on the ground. The satellite contains three experiments. These have been constructed by the University of Bristol, by the University of Leicester, and the third is a collaborative experiment constructed jointly by the Mullard Space Science Laboratory of University College London and by the University of Birmingham. At the top, you can see the white dome structure. This contains the University of Bristol experiment. Its main purpose to detect the very heavy cosmic ray nuclei which reach the neighborhood of the Earth from deep space. Coming now to the X-ray astronomy experiments, the one part of which you can see here is provided by the University of Leicester. Notice that it stands out a little from the main body of the spacecraft. This is to enable it to see past the Bristol sphere so that the sphere does not obstruct it. The experiment, in fact, has an identical twin on the far side, and so the entire experiment is made up of two identical pieces located diametrically opposite. You can't see any detail in this package because it's surrounded by a thermal layer. In fact, this material, which looks rather like kitchen foil, is in fact a plastic called mylar, many layers of which are used to insulate the experiments so as to control the temperature in orbit. The Lester experiment responds to X-rays in the energy range 2 to 50 keV. These X-rays enter gas-filled detectors through thin beryllium windows. When the X-rays are absorbed, they are converted to electrical signals. These signals are analyzed on board the satellite and the results transmitted to the ground station. Over here, we have the Mullard Space Science Laboratories experiment. This too is in two parts. 
with the second part being located on the other side of the satellite. You can see the solar panels going round, and these, of course, are absolutely vital, because from the various experiments, the satellite has got to have electrical power, and it gets that from the sun. So without these solar panels, the experiment simply wouldn't work, and the satellite would be useless. And needless to say, everything's got to be checked and rechecked and checked again, because when the satellite's in orbit, as in fact it now is, it's between 350 and 400 miles up, and there's no prospect of doing anything from the ground to repair it. And uh, in passing, uh, I'm afraid you can't see it with the naked eye, it's too faint for that. So if you do see a star-like object crawling across the sky, it may well be a satellite, but it won't be Ariel 6. There we can see the solar panels being closed, and everything's now being prepared to take the satellite over to its launching ground, uh, which is not in England, but it's in Wallops Island uh, in Virginia. And uh, that was the satellite when it was UK-6, and now of course it's in orbit, it has become Ariel 6. And as I've said, it shows every sign of being most successful. Well, at this stage, we are delighted to welcome to the sky at night Dr. Carl Hayden in person. Welcome, Leonard. Thanks, Patrick. Well, even after the satellite was taken away and put on Wallops Island, um, the launching was not entirely smooth to start with, was it? No, indeed. It was delayed by about 10 days, while a number of faults in the launching rocket were rectified. But happily, they were corrected, and we had a very successful launch. And uh, eventually, all the faults were ironed out, and uh, Ariel 6 was safely put into its orbit. I always think, you know, that a rocket launch is the most amazing sight. Uh, I've only seen one. How many have you seen? Oh, at, at least four. And uh, I'm very glad that this last one was one of the best. And there goes UK-6 to become Ariel-6. Pillar of flame coming out of the back of the Scout rocket. And uh, when it finally went off, the launching was entirely smooth. And there it goes. We pushed safely into its orbit, more than 350 miles above the ground. But of course, uh, when it's in orbit and the experiments are switched on, then comes the problem of receiving the signals and interpreting them. And that's done entirely in England. Yes, indeed. Uh, data are collected in the satellite, transmitted to a single ground station, which is located near Slough. The data are analysed there, then distributed to the various universities. Of course, in addition, it's necessary to send commands up to the satellite to change its many modes of operation, this activity, too, is carried out from the ground station, which is located in the Appleton Laboratory uh, in Slough. Here you see the control center in the Appleton Laboratory. People are engaged in observing data from the satellite and in sending commands to it. The large display board there shows the status of many of the circuits within the satellite. These circuits retain the commands which are sent up from the ground. People are closely monitoring data which is being sent down during one pass by the satellite over the top of Wingfield. So the signals come down from Aerial 6. And as we've already said, uh, the main targets for investigation are cosmic rays and X-rays. And I think before we go on, I'd better say just a bit about these because there may be some people who get fogged otherwise. Well, first of all, cosmic rays. Now, these, oddly enough, are not rays at all. They are high-speed particles coming from all directions in space, and there's a great deal about them we don't yet understand. But X-rays are different. These really are rays, and they are part of what we call the electromagnetic spectrum. Now, visible light, the light that affects our eyes, is a part of the electromagnetic spectrum, but only a very small part. And the colour of light depends upon the wavelength, that's to say, the interval between one wave crest and another. And for visible light, Red has the longest wavelength, and violet the shortest. And if the radiations are either longer than red or shorter than violet, you can't see them. If they're longer, they are infrared, and if they're shorter, they are ultraviolet. And I think most people are familiar with infrared and ultraviolet lamps in hospitals. And then going further out to either side, we have radio waves to the long wave end, and X-rays to the short wave end. And the X-rays are some of the main targets for Aerial 6. Because, as I've said, you can't study them from the surface of the Earth because they're blocked out by layers in the atmosphere. So before rockets and satellites came along, we knew nothing about X-ray astronomy. And in fact, the first discovery of an X-ray source in the sky only dates back to 1962. And that was really rather a lucky chance, because the astronomers weren't looking for it at that stage, it just came along. But since then, many more have been discovered, and X-ray astronomy has now become of vital importance uh, in modern astronomical research. But for it, you've got to have rockets, you've got to have satellites, and I think you'll agree, Leonard, that satellites are far more effective than rockets. 
Yes, indeed. They spend two, three, many years in orbit, permitting continuous observations. Rockets well, aloft only for five minutes or so. Well, Ariel 5 has, of course, done that. That was the last all-British X-ray satellite, and it's still up and still operating. Going yes, very well. Indeed it is. Its role was primarily to survey the sky, to find new sources. Ariel 6, on the other hand, will be used to study many of these sources in greater detail. Both cosmic rays and X-ray sources? Yes, indeed. Of equal importance, I would say. Yes, the cosmic rays are quite important, too, because they represent the only sample of matter that actually reaches the neighbourhood of the Earth from the depths of space. It's fair to say, isn't it, that an Ariel 6 is a logical development of Ariel 5? Yes, indeed it is. It will capitalise on the survey discoveries of Ariel 5, study many of these new objects in greater detail. As you've already said, there are three experiments aboard Ariel 6, one from Bristol University, one from Leicester, and one jointly from Mallard and Birmingham University. So uh, let's have a look at these in rather more detail, beginning with the Bristol one, which, as we saw in the pre-launch film, is on the top of Ariel 6. And this is what it actually looks like. Now that may seem rather complicated, but uh, I think that this diagram will explain just how it works. The Bristol experiment, as we've mentioned already, deals with the detection of very heavy, very high energy cosmic ray particles from space. You can see in the diagram that the cosmic rays, indicated schematically by these black lines, pass through an aluminium sphere. Inside the sphere, we have a shell of perspex and a specially selected gas filling. As they pass through, the particles give rise to two different kinds of light flash, one in the perspex shell, the other in the gas filling. These light flashes are detected by the photomultiplier tubes. By measuring the light signals, it's possible to estimate the mass and charge of the incoming cosmic ray nucleus. Which again ought to give us some information about just where they come from, and we're very uncertain about that at the moment. Here we are. So this should tell us more about cosmic rays. But let's uh, leave cosmic rays now, and let's move on to Leicester. And here we have another different experiment, and this deals with X-rays coming from the sky, and the entire scheme is different. Yes, the X-rays, which you can see entering the detector here, are detected in this box, which contains a specially chosen gas. The X-rays are converted to electrical signals in the gas. These electrical signals are processed in a number of electronic circuits here. The amplitude, or height, of each electrical pulse is measured and telemetered or sent by radio to the ground. Thus, we can determine the energies of the incoming X-rays. The collimator is used to isolate the region of sky where the X-ray source is located. Oh, that's the basis of the Leicester experiment. Now, the third experiment, the Mallard-Birmingham one, also deals with X-rays from space, and we have got a replica in the studio to show you. This experiment depends upon a battery of X-ray telescopes, but um, certainly an X-ray telescope and a visual telescope are by no means the same thing. You know, somebody said to me not so long ago, you can't have an X-ray telescope because the X-rays will simply go through it. And that doesn't sound quite so crazy as it might seem. No, indeed. But the experiment is designed to look at very low energy X-rays, which can in fact be reflected from metallic surfaces. Yes, of course, gold plating is very good at that, isn't yes, it? Indeed. So the X-ray comes in here at a very low angle, rather like a stone skimming over seawater, goes to the telescope and then into the detector at the back. Yes, at the back, where the X-rays are focused, we can control the size of the telescope aperture or the quantity or part of the sky which you can see. X-rays, after passing through the aperture, must enter the detector through a very thin layer of plastic. In fact, the thickness of this layer is no more than one ten-thousandth part of a centimetre. One ten-thousandth part of a centimetre. That's quite incredible. And of course, even making a thing that thin requires immense technical yes. skill. It was quite difficult. Of course, gas diffuses continually through this very thin plastic, and so must be topped up from the gas reservoir, which you see here. This topping up goes on while the spacecraft is in orbit. To what accuracy can you point these telescopes in the sky? better than a half degree. That's pretty good, isn't it? After all, just, just about the apparent diameter of the full moon. That's good enough for most purposes. Well, um, I think at this stage we finished describing the equipment, so we can probably now have it switched off. 
And I think it's fair to say again that these X-ray telescopes are something entirely new. I mean, they've only been going for a few years. Yes, that's quite right. They uh, have only recently been developed. Well, now let's turn, shall we, to the various objects you're going to study with uh, these various experiments on X-rays of on board Aerial 6. Um, to start with, what about these strange X-ray bursters? One of the first sources to be observed will be a burst source. It's primarily a target for the Leicester instrument, but this observation will be supported by optical and radio astronomers observing from the ground. I just wonder what, what a burster is. Well, a source which emits very intense pulses or bursts of X-rays, but the mechanism whereby this happened is not at all clear at the moment. Possibly Aerial 6 will tell us. We very much hope so. Then, of course, we have supernova remnants, such as this one, the Cygnus Loop. And that's the remnant of a star which must have exploded oh, long before there were any astronomers on Earth uh, to observe it. And it's left uh, a small source together with a shell of gas. And that's sending out X-rays. Yes, the shock which expands from the site of the explosion heats the interstellar gas to a very high temperature. Gas thus emits X-rays, which we can detect with the instrument here. And then on the fringe of our galaxy, we have the globular clusters. And I always love looking at these, you know. Imagine the sight of our summer, a member of a globular cluster, a huge assemblage of stars. X-rays from there, too. Yes, the very centers of these globular clusters are now known to be sources of X-radiation. They perhaps contain massive black holes. Uh, which generate the X-rays by heating infalling material. <laughs> I'm starting to wonder sometimes, you know, whether there are astronomers who regard black holes as a cure for everything. I don't know. But beyond our own galaxy, we have these active galaxies, the so-called Seiferts, which have got um, bright condensed nuclei and very faint spiral arms. And they certainly are strong X-ray emitters. Yes, one of the spectacular successes of Ariel 5 was to identify Seifert galaxies as a new class of X-ray emitting object. X-rays here again are generated at the very center of the galaxy. We hope by studying the variation in these X-rays to finally understand the mechanism for the enormous energy release which takes place in the central regions. And then in the far depths of the universe, clusters of galaxies so far away that huge star systems look, well, rather like star-like objects. And I gather that X-rays are being detected from there, too. Yes, but not from the individual galaxies, I should say, but rather from, once again, very high-temperature gas, which occupies the space between these galaxies. Now, I just wonder what, what mechanism activates it. Well, we believe that gas rushes into the cluster from outside, and in falling into the cluster is heated to the high temperatures necessary for X-ray production. Well, there's certainly plenty for Aerial 6 to do, and it's going to follow on the success of Aerial 5 and detect new sources as well, presumably. Well, rather than detect new sources, we believe its main purpose will be to study in great detail the individual sources which Aerial 5 and other satellites have already identified for us. How long will Aerial 6 continue to operate? Well, at the very least, we believe three years and perhaps longer. And I suppose the eventual end will be due not to the exhaustion of the gas in the satellite, but by the decay of the satellite itself when it comes down into the atmosphere. Yes, indeed, just so. What's the earliest that can happen? Well, as I've said, uh, not sooner than three years, but uh, the period could be quite a bit longer. It depends on solar activity. Well, let's hope that it is. Well, I'm sure that Aerial 6 has a lot to tell us. And, uh, Leonard, thank you very much indeed for coming and joining us this evening. Thank you, Pat. So, there we have it. Aerial 6 is up, it's in orbit, it's sending back results, and it seems set fair for a very long and very fruitful career. And, you know, isn't it pleasant to recollect that this is an all-British satellite, which does show, after all, that Britain is still very much in the forefront of world astronomy. So, for the moment, from Leonard and myself, and from Aerial 6, good night. <laughs>